Head pressure control. So inevitably, what are we trying to accomplish when we're controlling head pressure? Literally the high side pressure of the system, all right? So we need to maintain it at a certain level most of the time. Uh, and there's a few ways that we can accomplish that. The number one way is through fan cycle control. Uh, we can do a variable, a HPR or head masking. This is a little more advanced, but we'll talk about it uh, at least briefly. Uh, we see these a lot in refrigeration, but we also see these in process equipment. Hot gas bypass. Now, uh, hot gas bypass plays heavily into more of the evaporator temperature. But we'll talk about some anyway, just because it does affect the head pressure. So we'll definitely have to cover it. Yeah, so fan cycle variable speed, HPRs, hot gas bypass. <laughs> Inevitably, the majority of these all actually come into play once we get to a point where we're having a, some form of low ambient or low load condition, right? So mornings like what we have right now, we're getting down into the 60s some mornings. You know, my drive in, I see as low as 50s sometimes. Uh, granted, I'm coming from a little further outside of town, so it, it's a little colder out there. But, huh? <laughs> uh, now what happens what happens to our system when our condenser saturation gets equivalent to or below return air of our indoor coil You're on the right train of thought. What is the uh, what is the physical characteristic of refrigerants that impacts us here? So, if uh, it's say 60 degrees and our indoor return, i.e., return air, right, is uh, say 75, you know, we're doing a commercial building full of people. We, this is not going to work out very well, because what will happen is because the refrigerant is going to be attracted to the coldest point in the system, well, the coldest point in the system becomes our outdoor coil, not the indoor coil, right? And there's nothing in there to create a pressure drop in order to force that refrigerant to move, which is typically what we're doing at the evaporator, is that the pressure drop is causing a differential, with, which is allowing the compressor to pull back. Well, in this particular case, what will happen is you typically on a condenser coil, your top, we'll say, quarter, top 25% is the superheating. The 50% of your coil is typically going to be saturated. And then the bottom point of five, and your sub point. Right? This is a typical coil function. So let it follow. Let it follow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm make sure we don't have any questions. 
What is a fabric is you become inverted like this. Uh, you actually this 25% will turn into 50%. And what'll happen is all the refrigerant will start to stack. And the readings you'll see, you walk up to a system like this, it's in a low ambient condition. And your uh, evac set may be, uh, you may have a frozen flow, evac set may be increased with a 40 degree uh, superheat. And then your condenser set. Would probably be somewhere around five, where you might see, you know, 30 degrees of a uh, subcool. Quite literally. You might see 30 degrees of subcool, the 65 condenser stats, a 20 degree evaporator stat, a 40 degree super. Right. This is strictly because it's all staying right here. It's not actually flowing. And you're seeing it represented in the temperatures and all. And your superheat on your your discharge superheat on the compressor is going to be pretty significant. You know, it's going the compressor is going to be running hot here in this time frame. Your evap coil will freeze up. You know, you're going to see all the classic symptoms and a lot of people misdiagnose these with low charges. What it is, is you're in a low ante. Your, your saturation specifically has dropped below your indoor return, which cannot happen. You will see this condition in that state. So uh, if you ever question if this is the case, say you're working on a slip system or an RTU, either or, walk up to the common leg of your condenser fan motor and pull it and let your head pressure start to build. And monitor your saturation. Once you start hitting about 130 saturation, touch it back to the terminal real quick, let it turn back on. The moment you get down to about 90 degrees of saturation, pull it back off. You probably won't have to do that once or twice, and you're gonna see all these numbers immediately switch right back. I mean, it'll be quick. And it's a five minute test yeah, I'm in a low ambient state right now. You can, but it may not be effective enough depending on how cold it is. Like it may le legitimately be cold enough. Just the standing air alone is enough to do that. After that call, I got a call Monday morning from. Uh, a customer we just put a brand new system in on and it has fan cycle control and he went walking up to it and they're very detailed they're very routine and they're, they're, they pay attention to their equipment and the customer calls me because the condenser fan motor wasn't running but yet the condenser coil felt warm it was hot to the touch he could hear the compressor running but the fan motor wasn't on and he was legitimately concerned that his brand new unit had the fan motor stop working. Now, the space that it was controlling was still completely functioning fine. It wasn't having problems. He just noticed the fan wasn't running. And one of the symptoms, something that he had learned from us and working on other equipment out there was that, well, see if the motor feels hot to the touch. The motor was cold. So he was he was very concerned, but I, I explained to him over the phone, like, what's your outside air temp right now? It was just shy of 60 degrees. I said, okay. the ambient air was cold enough that the, the fan probably hadn't ran since sometime the day before. Yep. And, and this becomes more and more common with microchannel systems, right? So that particular one we put in had a microchannel condenser. And you have so much surface area on those microchannel coils, they don't, when you get low ambient, they don't need a fan. They're able to completely reject all their heat without it, and they'll never notice. So we have to be mindful of those, of those conditions, these states. This is 
real scenarios. Okay. Yeah. No, he's a good engineer. It really is. It's a problem. It's a problem. So, but this is the science behind it, is we're looking for the closest point in the system. So, my recommendation at, at any point is I'm going to shoot for a minimum of 80 degrees of uh, per sec. At any point in time, very minimal. Uh, you can sometimes run more. You know, I've I've set systems to run 90 degrees. Right. It really depends on what your particular application is, but 80 degrees is, is a good rule of thumb, especially when we're in a low ambient condition. It's not very often that that space is probably even going to get up to the 80s. It might during the summer, but we're not going to worry about low ambient at that point. But this gives you enough of a buffer room to where if you've got an office full of people, it might run 75 while it's 60 degrees outside. But that 80 degrees is more than enough to keep you from becoming inverted and the refrigerant to start stacking. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, and that should always be a disclaimer, like he, like, like, like he's saying. You know, always put that as a disclaimer. If it's below, if you're in a low ambient condition, low ambient condition by our standards is going to be anything below 70 outside. If you're at or below 70 degrees outside, you're in a low ambient condition state because your condenser saturation is going to be floating around 80 degrees or just slightly above at that point. So, you know, that's, that is our standard. So any inspections you do, any, any work you're doing, use that as, as your proper method. So fan cycle control is pretty, it's pretty simple. There is one caveat I'll throw into it, but it's pretty simple overall. Um, yeah, literally, I, I would recommend at any point when you're dealing with fan cycle control, always break the common leg of that motor. Don't break the start or the run or any of the others. You will harm the motor long term. You may not kill it immediately, but it ain't going to like it. Because part of it is if that motor already has some pre rotation and you kill, say, just the run leg, it might still try to sit there and force itself to spin when it should. So you definitely always want to kill that common leg. There you go. Oh, there you go. The questions are broken up in the first year. Can you can you your oh, yeah, 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 I can do that. Was there a specific question so far I can uh, backtrack on or from now going forward? You can share it. Oh, he might just be here, Marty. He can do it here. He can hear me. He can't hear you. He's just from now. Yeah, he's not Anyway, uh, there's something I'm going to warn you about on this. This is not a case in history. We're just damper control users. Variable airborne. 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 Variable airbor
uh, condensers that have a damper on uh, the condenser, the fan motors discharge, which would be a variable air volume setup. An example of that would be train condensers are pretty notorious for this. And they're not the only ones I can. I'm trying to think of. I've seen somebody else use those. I'm pretty, that's that's yeah. what I'm thinking is Daikin has something like that. Anyway, we'll get into them and discuss that too. Put that on the list. Fan side control. So it's a very crude but extremely effective. You're just off on depending on head pressure. Uh, they do sell just a standard peanut style uh, cycle control where you just, you, depending on what refrigerant you have, you go buy just a set switch that threads on and it's done. You know, your fan common leg is going to run through the switch. Pressure gets above. Uh, tips of, if you got one that was a 80 degree cutout, you have a cutout cut in. Uh, the, you know, usually on a peanut style, Cut out maybe 80, cut in maybe 105, 110. If it's even that much, it may be 100 degrees, something like that. Or maybe cut out at 90, cut in at 115 or something. Okay. The question was explain to cut out, cut in. So at cut out, I hear what you had going on there. That kind of we are stopping the fan. Stopping fan by breaking the line. Again. Starting. Inverse way. So, like I say, uh, if I'm walking up to a system and I'm manually setting it, so let's say we're installing a manual set fan cycle. Uh, it honestly is really preferred over a peanut style, but it is more expensive and it takes more setup. Regardless, my preference, my top end cutout, I'm going to want. It's usually going to be about 120 degrees of condenser saturation. Okay. And again, my bare minimum is going to be 80. Anywhere in between there, you want to set it is fine. The manual set ones, you will usually set, depending on which brand you buy, you may set the cut in or the cut out point and then a deferential. That's usually so there'll be two dials and two numbers. So on the face of it, you'll we'll have a little clear sight glass. Uh, it'll have a, two different metrics on either side, and it'll have a little, most times, they're like a little red little arrow. Yeah, a little red arrow coming out. And then depending on how you adjust it, will depend on what it is. So let's say this is your uh, cut in and this is your differential. So we may set the cut in point at, uh, let's say we, we set it here, we're cutting in at 100 degrees, okay? We may set a differential of 20 degrees, which would mean the cutout is now 80. Now, and there's still be two different knobs up here. So you'll have uh, one that will specifically adjust the differential springs. And when you've got a diaphragm assembly in here that's adjusting it. And you'll have another that is specifically for the cut, it, cut in or the cut out, I guess, depending on the brand. These are made to work with your service range. Okay. So when you see these little square dials up here, they're actually made where you can put your little service wrench up there and adjust them. Uh, 
Yeah, you're, you're turning it back on. So those are not the same scale on each of those. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm breaking the line to the fan, that means I'm turning the fan off, right? Yeah. Does that know what that means? Why am I, do, why am I turning the fan off once I reach 123? You're not turning off. I see the curve. I see the curve. Hold on. Cut out, stop in the fan. Uh, I wrote this right. I wrote this technically wrong. So, Oh, you got your one point? Cut in. Yeah, so this is being cut out. Let's count it. Oh, one degrees next to the other. Good. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was written backwards. My way. Yeah, I still don't understand the pressure controls. Yeah, it has something to really, really pay attention to because that fast, it'll get you backwards. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, question for caverns, are these proportional to each other? Why is like is this 20 degrees above because the arrow is above 100? And the answer is no. So these are independent uh, settings from each other and they run independent strings on the diaphragm. So and these diaphragms are very common leak points, by the way, on refrigeration systems. So if you're ever leak searching or seeing any kind of oil or anything of that nature, very, very common spots to get leaks. The, just the spring and it's very thin. Diaphragm is literally the diaphragm is held together by a spring pendulums and just a very thin piece of metal that's containing the refrigerant. And it's complete open refrigerant line. I've had these diaphragms literally just completely burst and bent the whole charge. So there's something to be aware of on those. Anyway, so I'm actually glad you brought that up. I'm using temperature here. In the field, this will actually be set to a pressure. Okay. Yes. So these aren't refrigerant specific at all. Uh, you, I'm using temperature as a reference point. So this may be a 200 PSI out of the field. And then you'll convert that yourself. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> the other question is on. So these are the manual set pressure controls. Head pressure, fan cycling control. And then the peanut ones again, they're, they're just, they'll have a cut in, cut out. You have to buy it correctly up front. And the, the supply house will have a whole bunch of them on the shelf. You got to pick the right one. They really will. Again, the common leg is what we're running through here. It'll, this switch will run in series with the condenser fan power. Okay. There's a caveat that I want to warn you about, and it's only a matter of time before you see this. 
when you are working on a heat pump system. Okay, heat pumps do many times in our area do actually still run cooling when it gets into low ambient conditions. Uh, I've had some heat pumps that are literally they, they've got an office in a garage, uh, and the uh, that office stays warm even though it's you know 60 degrees outside. They're still trying to cool. In most circumstances, that's not a big deal. If if the EXVs are inside, that's not too big of a deal. Uh, where it really gets you in trouble though, on most of the heat pump is once you do switch over to heating mode and your um, some of them, the, the metering device is literally in the liquid line right there coming back in to the condenser, to the outdoor unit. You know, most of the time there'll be a piston right there. Once it switches over to heat mode, it hits that piston. That pressure tap that you have turns into low pressure, which means that fan stays out all the time. Follow me. Where that leads to is your heat pump will no longer function at all. You're basically running like a blower motor would do with no fan ever. It'll constantly freeze up. It'll be flooding the compressor routinely. You're going to have constant issues. No, this is in general. And this is on a very specific design of heat pump. Okay. Would be your you know, suction line slash um, suction line slash discharge line if you're in a heat pump, right? And then right here would be your uh, service valve port you hook up on the outside of the printer and then going up. Well, in this particular case, what I'm referencing right here would be your liquid line, which on the heat pump is always liquid, except for a very specific style where your pressure service port and tap is right here. But right here is the medium device for heat mode. And it's it's a knuckle joint coming in to that, that outdoor unit. The problem is, if we're, because this is where we would always hook up for a fan cycle control, is off of that liquid line tap. This now becomes two phase in the, in the heat mode of that system, not liquid line. Are you following me? Exactly. In heat mode, this porch becomes a low pressure port and it kills the fan and freezes the coil. And your coil is going to constantly freeze. And depending on depending on which package they bought, likely it will constantly be going into a defrost nonstop. If it ever goes into defrost, you know, if it's not just strictly going off a of time. You know, some of them base it off a of time, some of them base it off a of coil tap. So most of the time on these that I've worked on, they're usually basing off of time. And in that amount of time, but no fan ever. One, they don't heat well because you're not picking up heat. And then two, they just they, they turn into this massive block of ice. To get around this, you have to wire in a fan lockout uh, relay. And this is something you have to do in the field. Because these, these particular pieces of equipment are not designed to run, uh, you know, they're not specifically designed for commercial application that need low ambient control. So is that relay that's actually the first one? Are you talking about this? So it just needs one relay. 
And that really basically, let's see if I can remember. See if I can actually remember how to draw. You can do this with a single pole double throw relay. Let's say you've got your coil 24, uh, you have your common. Uh, up here would just be uh, you'd have your power coming from the contactor. Say it's uh, say this is L1. L1 coming off contactor to be your common leg going to your fan. Your O terminal would run through the coil. So the O terminal coming from the thermostat, coming back out, and going to C. So anytime that O was energized, uh, which would be for cooling, we're going to cycle the relay, and you would run your pressure controls uh, to your fan motor common through this relay. So this normally opening would go to your pressure control. Yeah, this would close. You're running off of your head pressure control for low ambient. Then when O is not energized and you're in heating mode, then you would bypass the pressure control and go straight to uh, the fan common. Now, some units will have two pressure right? Um, you don't need a pressure control for a heat mode on a heat pump. Because at that point, you're, you're talking your indoor. Your indoor coil becomes your condenser. Right. Okay. So what I'm curious about is, what are you seeing in that time? Okay. Okay. So Kirk is saying that he's seen some equipment that has a pressure control, one for heating mode and one for cooling mode for the outdoor fan. Okay. Very intrigued by that. I may be wrong. I could be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> now, we, we have now the defrost control board controls fan in heating because when it goes into defrost, it kills the fan. Right? Well, we'll have a heat pump class coming up for any like this. Not, not like, we just, we just talked about how we didn't want to kill the fan to keep it from freezing. Right. Now we're talking about heat pumps. Now we're talking about heat pumps. Yes. 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 yes, this that is where we'll get into. We'll have a, we have a heat pump class coming up in two weeks. Oh. <laughs> is it October? Yes, October. October class is going to be heat pump and electric heat refresher. So we'll get into the defrost side of heat pumps then. We'll spend a ride on the fence, but like we don't want to kill the fans because the thing will freeze, but we want to kill the fans so we can unfreeze it. Like this is this is uh this is what you would set up your, your heat lockout or your pre head pressure lockout relay on that system. So this is something that you would be filled installing with this. We're the just inside the condensing unit. As soon as you get inside the condensing unit, there's a TNT right there. You see a lot of times. This one you're talking about, you'll be on the outside. Before it hits the unit? Yeah. So, Casey's question was 
most systems we open up, we see the, especially like on RTUs, uh, but even split systems, we see the, like a TXV on the inside, not on the outside of the, of the system. In this particular case, this will be on the outside and it won't be a TXV, it'll be a piston. I've never seen these be TXVs. These will be a fixed bore piston metering device with a with a you know, knuckle joint coupling right there. And the, the suction line will still be sweat, but the liquid line will have a knuckle joint, which is an immediate indicator that, that system probably has a metering device there. Another uh, verification you could try to do is if you, those knuckle joints are supposed to have stamped on them the orifice size that it, it takes. So if you look at that joint, if you ever see a knuckle joint you, get, you don't know, look and see if you can see a stamped number in it, like a 0.09 or something. And so if you ever had to replace one, that's the number we need to know. Right. And it's also important to know if it's a heat pump or not, because the heat pump orifices are a different style than a regular cooling orifice most of the time. Depending by direction, depending on what direction refrigerants need to go in, it'll be a different type. So be careful with that. So anytime you write that kind of stuff up, it's it's not that simple and it's extremely rare that the manufacturing data so we'll go back to the supply house and we give a model cereal most of the time honestly they have no idea what orifice is in there their they, their specifications they look back at aren't that specific we have to know that in the field now they can guess they can go look at one that's on the shelf they can do things to kind of figure it out but that doesn't mean that was just, that's what was actually installed on that coil. Do you really want to know what that stamped orifice number is? Yeah. Like I said, I've, I've only seen, I think, two or three of these throughout my career. The first one I ran into threw me for a freaking loop because I was not prepared for it. It took me a minute to figure it out. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I came up with this on my own and then talking to other people, I figured out that this is actually kind of a common thing. So, uh, Carlos, for example, just in conversation, I realized he ran, ran into the same stuff before and has had to do the same modifications. So, anyway. Be forewarned. Huh? Yep. Okay, we're doing on um, fan cycle control, cycling the fan, different types of versions. Uh, we could talk about courtesies, but kind of I'm hesitant to. Courtesy yeah, okay. is pretty straightforward. The vast majority of the time, they're going to be uh, just an ECM motor, usually. They could have train has actually produced motors that they, they have a fan motor controller installed in the outdoor unit and it will monitor head pressure and it will actually I think it does it through resistance. It will control fan speed based on the resistance. Kind of like a regular motor speed controller we would install on a V or a fan power box. Same concept, just 10 times the price because it's got a train loader on it. Uh, anyway, so there, that, those are the, probably the two most common versions we see on regular, regular duty, light duty type equipment. ECMs are becoming extremely popular. Uh, a lot of your Daikin RTUs that are coming out, things of that nature have ECM based uh, condenser fan motors. And you'll have a set of power wires going to them, and you'll have a set of communication wires going to them. And uh, 
you know, that's that's how it tells it what speed to run. And it's all based off of pressures and what saturation is one to achieve. Almost always, we don't even have the ability to adjust that. All that is set at the factory based off of what they say is the most efficient for their equipment. But the nice part about that is the existence is extremely taxing on the whole system. Because you're talking to just a, this nonstop swing of pressures, the condensers, the compressors are constantly feeling it, the fan motors really feel it. I mean, every time you slam one of those clothes, those bearings just really want to punch it. Um, variable speed in that way. We, we, can, we can achieve tremendous efficiency out of a variable speed motor strictly because for every two or three psi that the system shifts we can speed and slow up slow down that motor fast enough to keep up with that change to where inevitably instead of having this swinging graph we just kind of have this kind of just barely nudging along we really don't change much and their goal is okay we want to achieve this specific set can enter pressure enter saturation temperature at any given time and that's their main focus. And they can accomplish that at variable speed. Uh, once you start getting into the bigger systems and really on the much heavier side, you'll actually start running into uh, VFD controlled condenser phase. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very common. At that point, it would be kind of a hybrid between the two. Half of the fans, or maybe if you have six, four fans will be ran off the fan cycling. And they'll be broke out into two groups themselves. You have first stage fans, second stage fans, and you have a, the, the other two fans left over will be variable speed. We'll have the two fans of dampers on. Right. So, uh, very common to see these blended together. Um, and at that point, we're operating like a regular VFD. It, it just, this, all the same principles apply, all the same troubleshooting applies. It's a VFD, it needs a control signal reference. Some of those drives will actually look at the transducer directly. An example of that carrier, their motor master uh, VFDs will actually, you'll run the transducer directly to the VFD, not through these system controls. And then it will convert a zero to five volt signal to a head pressure and then ramp its fan speed based off of that head pressure. So there are some uh, condenser fan drives that, that that's, that's how they function. Others, you know, the, the, the unit controls read the pressure and then they send a signal for I want you to run at you know 60 hertz, 50 hertz, whatever. So you have both versions. Are there any questions on that? Yeah, so the question there was the first version, the VFD decides what it needs to do. Second version, the VFD just listens to what it's being told. The answer is yes. Um, on the first version where the VFD still decides where to run itself, it is still receiving a start-stop command from the unit controls. Uh, so I'll give a carrier a 30 HG, or yeah, HGX series air-cooled chiller. There's two circuits, two different VFDs. It, one, it, Circuit one, when it is enabled, it sends a start signal for just circuit A's or circuit one's motor master. And circuit B won't enable until it enables that circuit. So it will have two, two separate little ice cube relays in the control panel that specifically fire start stop for those uh, micro drives, which is what those are referred to. The vast majority of them are on micro drives. Uh, the Daikin packs, as they call them. So those are not the Rebel series where they have ECM motors. The Daikin packs 
uh, which is their spin off of Intellipack. You know, they're in that little refrigerant compartment down the below. I mean, that, that is strictly running off of the Microtech 3 controller. It's being told everything it needs to do from that controller. It's not independent. Uh, but those are just standard condenser fan motors being ran off of a drive. There again, we've got our newer series of train air cool chillers coming out where all the fans are running off ECM motors. And they're on a comm bus between each fan. So you may have 24 fans on top of this one chiller, and every fan is interlinked through this bus. And we've had it before where one fan shorts out internally and it takes the whole bank down. Remember that? Yeah. Well, there's 24 fans, but it was deep. Now they're basically like that on the bus. There's more than eight. There's quite a. There's. there's this is a weird thing. Yeah. This is actually our first inspection in my building we did. Anyway, uh, in that particular scenario, we, we literally just removed that fan from the from the bus, the control bus, and capped it separately. And all the other fans took off, started doing their thing, and we just ordered that one fan, replaced it, got it back online, everything was on dory. But that is the world of variable speed head pressure control that we live in now. Make sense? Okay. Yes. Is that thing primarily head pressure? Is that more so based on load of the? Why would why would some compressors like I know a lot of things max out at sixty hertz, but I've seen like compressors running like two hundred. Yeah. What's what's going on there? We're like so <laughs> we're so good. So the question uh, for everybody online is the compressors themselves being variable speed, uh, whether it be VFD or, or well, I mean, they'll be VFD inverter driven. Uh, and even taking it even further, them being more than 60 hertz motors, it being 200 hertz motors, right? Uh, and, and actually, that's not uncommon at all being the fact that like a lot of the VRV systems will run significantly higher hertz than that. Um, the main focus is not actually for head pressure control. Even on those systems that have variable speed compressors, the fans are still responsible for controlling the head pressure. The compressor is responding to the load and demand on the equipment. So we'll use, it's the same control logic either way, whether you're looking at a air-cooled chiller, a Yorks specifically, uh, or whether you're looking at outdoor air unit, or you're looking at a, um, shoot. Anyway, so the compressors, are just they're just basing off of whatever whether it be return air or entering water leaving water load is they're set to achieve a certain goal and then there'll be a separate logic loop for the fans and their main focus is to control the head pressure so once the compressor begins to ramp down as it unloads and we begin to drop in head pressure because we're ramping down then the logic that is running the fan motors will respond to the head pressure drop and start ramping the fans down. Not because, you know, the compressor is not controlling head pressure at that point. The fans are now. There is safeties built into that, that compressor logic that if it sees either amperage or head pressure start to exceed limits, it will limit that compressor's ability to go beyond a certain point because it doesn't want it to go into a safety or a negative condition. So they, it's not that there's no interaction at all, but it's only at a safety level. So. That is something done through logic software. 
Uh, so all the control boards. So you'll have a, a dedicated inverter board or, or a VFD, VSD, thing on whatever brand you're working on, that runs that motor. And that lot that that VSD is reporting to the main M MCB main control board that is monitoring the entire system and all of its readings. And that board is then communicating to the fan control board, which is then telling the fans at what levels and how to operate. And then they all just, they, they, they talk. So, uh, yeah. And when it comes to, you know, overclocking, when you really start getting into, this is something you're gonna wanna be preparing yourself now for. The day and age where everything is a flat line 60 hertz is quickly evolving. We have air handlers now. They come from the factory designed at 88 hertz on the motors. I just don't want to see that on the front of what we deal with. I think that's more so that the pressure ramp up to 200. I was like, I think that's more so that the pressure ramp up to 200. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just blew my mind because I'm used to seeing that at max. You go like over three times. Right. And that is traditional technology. Just like at one point in time, fixed orifice and capillary tubes were the way we controlled all system load, superheat. And then TXVs came out and that just rocks the AC world for decades. And we're really just now getting to the point where that, well, I say just now, in the last 20 years, that's become the new standard. And as soon as it started to become the new standard, EXVs now hit the market and EXVs are currently rattling everybody's world because they struggle to understand them so much. It's just a simple stepper, really not that complicated. In the same way, 60 hertz was an old standard and it's still used today. But another 10, 20 years from now, you can throw that 60 hertz value to the wind. Because it's going to be the old school way of things. You know, we run all kinds of motors. It, most of the systems that are variable speed, they're specifically designed to be variable speed. Daikin is a prime example where, you know, they're not limiting. They, they have specifically tailored design compressors that are made to run at higher frequencies to achieve the efficiencies that they're looking for and the speeds that they're looking for. It's just the way it is. So, uh, yeah, even a 60 hertz motor, you can ramp above 60 hertz, given the right parameters. But you have to do it properly. <laughs> All right, very much for your fans. Sense? They do make single phase in their piece. Huh? I know, I know. I thought most variable speeds you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it. Most. Yeah. Most. Yeah. 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 Now, we'll touch quickly on air pressure control. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but an abbreviated version is we're bypassing the uh, we're bypassing the condenser coil in order to maintain head pressure. I guess bypass is specifically designed to go from the discharge line and dump back into the two phase line going back into the evaporator. Oh, you're talking about going I'm talking about going from, so on your condenser, 
That will be. I've <laughs> got your coils here. Uh, your discharge line coming off the compressor. Got your liquid line coming out my back to the indoor. Between here, you'll have your HPR valve. Uh, this is extremely common in refrigeration, like low temp stuff. And we see this a lot in a lot of your process equipment, okay? We do have a goal as a company to really start getting more into the industrial side of the market. This is how many industrial systems function. We, do, we don't change the fan speed. We don't do anything with the fans most of the time. What we change is the flow through the condenser. So as the ambient air decreases outside, and we begin to decrease in head pressure, as this deferential become, starts to become greater and, and we get below a certain threshold, uh, this valve will open up and begin to bypass the coil and add that heat from the compressor right back into the liquid line. Now it won't 100% bypass it, it'll do it on a modulated basis as needed to maintain a minimum head pressure control. Yes, yes, it's, it's check. It's looking at the difference between these two. Um, try to do that right. Differential with the traces. I mean, there wasn't heat that much. How would that? How would there be a differential there? Because you're you're cooling the refrigerator. Right? So, let me let, let me kind of clarify. I probably shouldn't have used the term differential as much as I should have used the term the outlet pressure. And I need to relocate this because actually I got to thinking about it. It wouldn't be like in the middle of the line. It kind of comes in like a, as like a three-way. Yeah, it would be a, it would be at a T point or three-way point in that line. And these can be a couple of different designs. Uh, most of the time, they'll be in our particular applications. They'll be an adjustable valve with a with a spring set, and the it'll, it'll look like a really funky looking TXV, but it won't have a sensing bolt. It'll have a big cone sticking out of the head with a cap you can take off, stick an Allen in, and adjust the spring to set what leaving pressure you're trying to maintain. Okay. Now, on like low temp equipment and doing like walk in refrigeration, most of the time these are not settable. They'll have, it'll look like a THV with, it'll, it'll even have a little power head looking bulb on top. But it won't have a, a sensing bulb. It'll have like maybe just a little stub out. There's maybe a long. That'll be about it. Again, it's function and purpose. It's not. Those aren't adjustable. Those will be set to where I'm going to have a, a set liquid leaving pressure. Best liquid pressure drop. Correct. And. Now, obviously, that's going to have an impact on your subcooling. It's going to have an impact on the whole system. But uh, yes, that would be an HPR and like a low temp refrigeration. Now, a process chiller or a process cooler or something of that sort would ha have a different style. Look. It doesn't look the same. But if you walked up to a walk in cooler, it's going to have something like that on it. If it uses head pressure control at all. Some of them don't, they use fan cycling. Instead, it'll be one or the other. Uh, somebody who does a really good job of explaining that is uh, HVACR videos. He actually he deals with head pressure controls all the time, uh, way more than we do. And he's got some videos on there where he talks about that on their side of things. Again, I bring this up because we you will see these on the heavy commercial side and in the industrial side of things. We don't do low temp refrigeration. 
but you will still run into this, so be aware. We're not changing the condenser fans or nothing else. We're actually bypassing the condenser entirely. Okay. I'm not going to be in the middle of the table. Yeah, I said. Except they'll have three ports instead of two. Sorry, I must have been filming. Wheels are current, right? How are we doing in our chat? Nobody's having this question. No. As I said earlier, we'll have a pipe going from your discharge over to the two phase line of your evaporator. <laughs> this has less to do with. Condenser head pressure control, more to do with evaporator control, but I just, it all kind of works together. So many things. And you'll see these on many rooftop units that have some sort of dehumidification control or reheat or some version of train. It's very common to use these, very, very common. Most all of your outside air units will have some version of this. My Aeons and Daikin Rebel systems will have a hot gas bypass valve that is an EXV typically. Okay, uh, come back. Out the compressor. Your discharge line through the condenser coil. We'll have a line. Off here. Um, these will. Oh, so these will actually be like kind of in the middle of the circuit. And they're looking at the differential pressure between these. So, like a regular head pressure control, I think it's why I got confused. So like, well, a regular head pressure control is looking at the leaving pressure to maintain a minimum, right? A hot gas bypass control is looking at actual deferential to maintain a set range. So what will happen is uh, we come out the connector, we hit the uh, TXV, and then we come out of two phase line, we come over to our evaporator. This will pipe over and land right here. <clears throat> In your two phase suction lines come over here and up. This is trying to monitor so much differential between these. These will also be adjustable. All right. Uh, and I, we, again, in a, it's working really funky, in a process system where we're trying to process cool industrial type equipment, you'll have this and head pressure HPR control. And you have to balance the two with each other. It is very fun. The first couple of times that you're going to get real. Yeah. Oh, right. it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, makes, what makes it worse is the compressor usually in the indoor section and they and that's where the hot gas bypass will be, the HPR will be outside of the condenser. Yeah, it's fun, it's fun to balance. Anyway, your crack systems are real common to use these as well. Again, a lot of your RTUs, your outside air units will have a version of this. The main function of this is so that when we're under a lower load or we have a lower indoor coil, like return our channel. We can still maintain saturation without going into freeze. That's the primary function of a hot gas bypass is to maintain saturation for your evap while still maintaining the load. 
Follow me there? Because without it, we end up going into a state where that coal would freeze. That's why crack units are so common to use. Because they, they typically are running a much lower return temp. So we have to introduce hot gas bypass. We're still moving the same capacity to control the load. But, we're, but what will happen is these coil gloves are to be oversized for pull downs. So to compensate for the oversizing, the hot gas bypass will provide that additional BTU input. And then if we did have a hot, high load and we needed to pull down or say the servers were under heavy load demand for whatever reasons, you know, everybody's online watching their stuff. This gives us higher capacity on the coil when we need it, and when we don't need it, and all the servers are ran down and everybody passed out. Uh, this will let us drop to that load. So uh that that's the function of like a hot gas bypass system which plays into this will have an impact on your head pressure obviously because you're bypassing the condenser coil and going straight so you'll run lower head pressures in a condition like this which in usually with these you'll have some with well, a system that's going to have this you'll have a system that has head pressure control whether either any of these three just pick one like for your RTUs, you know, will typically be kind of a combo. They'll have both of these, one or two fans with variable speed or variable volume, and then the other fans are fan cycling while the indoor coil is running high gas bypass. Monitoring. Uh, I feel like you've already said it, but I'm getting tired of here trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, it's monitoring pressure pressure, but it's looking at the saturation temp of the coil or what? It's figuring out what oh, it needs to bypass. That's where we come in as a technician. We have to calibrate stuff like that. So it'll have an adjustment on the head. So an example would be uh, a train typically will have a, a hot gas bypass solenoid on their uh, RTUs and when they need to go into a hot gas bypass state because they sense that the coil saturation or coil temperature is dropping too low because uh, they actually monitor inlets and coil temp, right? So when they see that temperature start to get too low but they still need to run cooling to maintain humidity and load in the space, they'll activate the hot gas bypass solenoid and start flowing through the hot gas bypass control valve. With that valve, well, it'll look like a THP body. It won't have an adjustment. You'll have an inlet port, outlet port. You'll have a, you'll have a type of control head. A lot of times it'll be like this little cone thing with a little cap on top. This cap will spin off and you can stick an Allen wrench in there and there is a there is a plate for the set of spring coils pushing down on the diaphragms which are activating um, the internal of this valve which are responding to the deferential pressures. So the higher the deferential, the more it's going to open, the more it's going to allow bypass. And as that deferential decreases, it's going to close back down to reduce flow. And it's eventually, you know, once it balances, it'll find the happy medium it's looking for. You know, just kind of sit there and cruise until it's just not needed anymore. On the, on the condenser fan motors, yes. So, again, this is going to cause your head, your head pressure to want to drop. 
because it bypasses the condenser coil. And so when the head, when the fans see that head pressure drop, the, the, the logic in the fans will respond and start cycling the fans accordingly. But this is where the whole thing is, is it's very, it's tuned in. It's, it's, it's got to work together. Otherwise, if this is, if this is not set properly and the, and you can control the logic on mo most of these units, you can control the logic for, uh, how reactive the condenser fans are. You can make them more reactive or less reactive to head pressure fluctuations. Depending on where you set all of that will depend on how well the system will ever function. Because you get too crazy with this and this, it can sit there and swing all freaking day long until it breaks itself. Make sense? So you see what I mean by how these play apart together? It's really not that bad. It's not that often we got to mess with it. Not in our area, right? If we were, you know, hundreds of miles north in a couple of states above us, where they deal with low ambient way beyond what we ever deal with it, yeah, we, we this would be a constant thing we deal a lot more with. We don't. <laughs> I see. I included the bird bird Anyway, the point is, though, you, you mean, it's a very limited scope of the time we are actually doing this. Okay. Yeah. I feel like the bigger the equipment, the more likely we are to run into. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and and the application. Yeah, I mean, like big RTU, you run into it. Big chiller is probably most definitely going to be there. Like it's the bigger the most bigger, and more expensive the equipment gets. I feel like more. So oh, one of the really easy ways to know if you're in a hot gas, hot gas bypass state, this little line that comes off, just grab it. Is it? Let's see if it's hot, right? If it ain't hot, then you run it. You can check. So. I don't remember specifically, and I think it depends on the equipment because some solenoids are normally closed. Keep that in mind. The vast majority we work on are normally open valves. There are some of them are normally closed, so it's when it activates the coil that it opens. Uh, it depends. I don't remember. I don't remember. It's bigger to be normally closed, and then when it hits that state, it opens up the solenoid and allows the gas to go. Yeah, I really don't remember. I know some of the train uh, centrifugals have vent solenoids for oil uh, control that are normally closed solenoids. You have to activate on that startup to open for like 30 seconds, and they, they deactivate and close, and it's, it's all part of the oil balance. So, so keep that in. So it just it really depends on that particular unit. I don't again we don't have to work on them enough. I don't know from memory. You know, it's one of those things I just account for whenever I, I have to work on. Them. Um, but like I said, well, you just you grab that pipe. If the pipe is hot, it's flowing or it's flowing discharge. If it ain't hot, it's not being used. On a 90 degree day, I wouldn't expect it to be used. A 70, 65. Yeah, it might be. Anyway. Uh, basically, yeah, you would grab you would grab them the same way. Yeah, like you bought something. I'm just making sure that we're all on the same page here. We're adding this. 
kind of like our review on the road, maybe it's just current fan cycles, fan cycles, which currently cutting and setting it off in the pressure. Yeah, yeah, no, you definitely want to log into that stuff. Yeah, because this will cause havoc on your read. Like we can you're not gonna get confirmed charge with a condition with the unit in this state. If you're in bypass or if you're in head pressure control, yes. Yeah, and you have to account for it. And you, and you can up to a certain point, right? Because you can you can figure, you know, head pressure saturation ought to be pretty much degree for degree. Right. And so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that you can take into account. But when you get into a state where you're running bypass, whether it be to that or APR valves, or you got fans cycling speeds, I mean, you're, you're in no man's territory. You're, you're not, the system's not stable enough to just know what, what to actually have to do. All you're really checking at that point is that you're not in a critical state. And you're making your best assessment that you're functioning within reason. That's really the most you can do at that point with any certainty. Then you start dealing with economizers. Then the then the economizer kicks off. <laughs> <laughs> so it's for for fresh technicians who've never done much either on the on the commercial side or they just they just haven't really seen much. It's always a phone call. I, I, it just makes me chuck. <laughs> Just remember being there and just yeah, don't worry. It'll, this will happen to probably every single one of you where you'll show up. I got Y1 calling and I got Y2 calling and I ain't got a compressor on and something broke. Actually, go look at your economizer. Is it wide open? It's more than likely that the economizer's got the compressor locked up and it's doing free cooling. And they'll even have a light on you light up and say, Free cooling to tell you. They know from experience they've been through that. They, they know. I'm making soft calls. All right, we're good. Yes. Unloading. Unloading goes back to the variable speed compressor conversation. So we're not using compressor head loading and unloading for head pressure control. Whether it is for, uh, whether it's an electronic unloader, whether it is a electromechanical unloader, or, or whether it's a straight mechanical unloader, right? Either way, the unloader's function is to help the compressor control load, not head pressure. And where a variable speed compressor may actually be limited by conditions, most of the time your actual hard load and unload compressors won't. There's not that much logic there on those. So they will push themselves to the point of stripping on safeties where a lot of your variable speeds probably won't. They'll, they'll limit out before they ever get there. So, so at that point, it just this could be happening on a 100 degree day. You, this is, uh, there's just not that much load in the space and our, we're satisfying our supply air temperatures and we just don't need all of the compressors run. Or bleeding through. So scrolls have unloading ability. Scrolls have two types of unloaders. Um, 
So it's real. Yep, and we'll talk about that. Scroll compressor. Uh, they'll have something that looks kind of like this, so a little tube coming off. They'll have a cylinder valve on the top, and then it will come down and dump back into the suction line. Okay. Uh, that is a external unloader on a scroll, and these are very specifically designed with with certain uh, like a fixed orifice, if you will, to where it it'll reduce the refrigerant volume being moved by fifty percent, not one hundred. Okay, and you'll see that your amps and all drop with it. So you're not completely bypassing all flow at that point. You might as well turn the thing off. No, we're actually limiting how much flow it's able to send by sending some of that flow and drive back through. And this will be electronically controlled. Yeah, and, and you'll, you'll see, yeah, that's what it'll be. The compressor won't be turning off and on. I've actually got a video I just released Saturday. If you listen to the video and if you read the comments, people were freaking out over the compressor in the background working on an A on you. Yeah, and, and they were like, oh my God, your compressor is going to blow up this, da, 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 da. You know, they, they, no, actually, it's what they were hearing was the compressors unloading and loading. And it was kind of a cooler morning at that point, too, which is only makes it more common for it to happen. And but it doesn't sound pleasant. I mean, it, they, they sound rough and it happens. And those compressors I was working on that day had internal unloaders. So the only difference between that and internal is you've got your main three wire power plug, right? You'll have a separate uh, plug with like two little blue wires going through the time. And so you'll have your power plug and then a second plug kind of on the back side. That that is a internal that is an internal electromechanical motor. <laughs> So we'll fire 24 volts on those two wires, and what's happening out here happens internally in here, is inside the compressor. Okay. We're not trying to control a head pressure. Right? This function has nothing to do with head pressure. This is strictly load responses on the evaporator coil. We're only trying to control load. Now, it impacts your head pressure because obviously we're reducing volume going to the condenser. So all your condenser controls will have to respond accordingly. Less volume going to it means less, less flow meaning that we're not going to have as much head pressure, meaning we have to control those fans even further to match that lack of pressure. That's not going to raise the pressure due to a raise in temperature because you're pushing that hot gas back into that compressor at negative, at zero. Yeah, you get up to kind of need to decrease the temperature of what you increase. So it's kind of flashing as it. So, so you, you still have enough flow happening on your evaporator that it is still controlling the motor temperature. But you just took half of the load off of that compressor. Your amps go from eight to four. Right? Yes. Yeah, and, and, and so because your amps are lower, your KW is lower, which means the heat you're introducing 
to the refrigerant, the additional superheat is it's bounced. So yes. And then what, even though you're flowing a lesser amount through the suction line, what you are flowing is still enough to handle the heat load being generated. So you don't end up with the heat. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, push the hot gas to the discharge. I mean, it seems like it should come back super, super hot into the suction, but I guess the suction is cooling it off. You'll see your head pressure decrease, and you'll see your your suction pressure increase because you know, it's 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 bypassing. Whether external or internal is still bypassing, and you'll see the increase and decrease. Um, and then now you'll see the decrease on the head pressure at first. But if you're in a low ambient state, it won't be very long and you'll probably see it start to come back up because you'll start cycling down the condenser pin. Now your low side pressure will still remain high. But the only reason your, head, your high side pressure starts to go up is because their fans begin to cycle. I wish I could turn the camera around. <laughs> yes. So this is this is floating and unloading for a scroll. What is it? What is it? What is it? This is strictly scroll. So your pressure and your 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 sound and your pressure to coincide. So you're gonna hear it on You're gonna watch your pressure change all around the same time. Yes. What is it? What is the logic loop that's controlling discharge air tank on, on an RTU? Or if this was, say, a chiller, for example, it's the logic in the controller controlling leaving water temp, right? So we'll, we'll stick with an RTU. Your discharge air set point is still 55. You get down to 54. You're beginning to overcool. Okay, we need to cycle down. Well, instead of killing the compressor, unload one compressor, we get back to 55. And then once we get back to 56 degrees of supply, there, we see, okay, we're starting to go up and we're like, well, let's reload that compressor. We uh, load in, and you're depending on your load and your safety times. So there'll be safety timers where it'll it'll require a minimum of time to stay loaded or unloaded. Yes, I mean for like an Aon, you know, it'll be pretty tight tolerance. Yeah. It increases efficiency and life cycles tremendously because on a motor, what what can, how are motors rated in America or in general? When a motor is designed and built, how is it rated for life cycle? Is it hours? It starts stops specifically starts. When they when they build and design a motor, they design it based on the starts. If we can reduce the number of starts, you're extending its life. And we require a fraction of the energy because we're not a lock rotor. So instead of, you know, yeah, we're not trying to go. All right. So this is where unloading control becomes a really big factor, but it plays into our fancy control. Because we are taking load off of the system. Now, on a uh, on a semi hermetic, you know, Carlisle, you'll have two different types. You'll have electromechanical, and you'll also have a mechanical. And you'll have either hot gas bypass on the head, not this hot gas bypass. Okay, we're talking a hot gas bypass on the on the compressor head itself. Meaning that a valve will open internally on that head of the compressor and it will cycle the refrigerant through from the discharge to the suction of that head. But I'm, I think we need some context there. Yeah, I mean, well, there might actually be one in that shot. 
There is one actually. Yeah, no, there is one. It's just we can't get to it right now. So where is that? Uh, Carlisle compressor. Okay, so we're looking at the, the front of the compressor. Very ugly, beautiful filter. Uh, it'll have, it'll have three, three heads, our beautiful artwork. And each of these heads will have, oh, I say each, the, typically the discharge head, the top head won't. But this head will, and you can on this one too. You'll have an unloader. Now, whether that unloader has a silver flow or has a big brass nut on it, will decide whether it's electromechanical or whether it is straight mechanical, pressure activated. Okay? Uh, if it has a solenoid valve, then you're, again, we go back to the logics. There's a control board that is monitoring that triggers that solenoid valve to activate based off of load conditions to achieve, you know, maintaining discharge air temp on the unit. All right. Now this head uh, right here, you've got, uh, you'll have kind of an oval shape and you'll have the two discharge ports like so there'll be a gasket here and then you'll have this big open section at the bottom which is your suction gas okay uh, this is literally right here on the plate uh, there's there's more to this than this but this will give you an example but when this unloader activates it will bypass the discharge refrigerant getting pushed out the piston from here, and it'll open a little chamber between this divider wall and allow this discharge gas to flow back into the suction and cycle back into the piston of the compressor, and the piston will just push it right back through. And so what will happen is we kill this end, but these two are still pumping. And then we get to a point where we must, we need to unload with two heads, so we kill this head, now only the top one is pumping. Now at that point, we, there's no point in killing the third head because we we'll, might as well have the compressor off at that point. But we can unload both heads, and they may only have the one of the three heads unloaded. So this would be a hot gas bypass on a compressor unloading. You also have suction cutoff. Okay, that's the other style where we literally, you know, instead of opening a chamber between the discharge and the suction side, it will close the chamber that is allowing the suction gas to flow through and into the piston. So the piston will just sit there and pull into a vacuum and pump and pump and pump and pump and never go anywhere. And it's not moving anything because the suction gas has been sealed off to it. So those are your two unloader styles are like a car house and a Hermetic. Oh, pressure. So it, it specifically, there'll be a little pressure tap that it'll be monitoring the suction pressure. And when suction pressure drops to a certain pressure, which will be manually calibrated by you, uh, Yep, they'll have a brass nut that you can take a crescent wrench to and adjust. It'll have a cut in point, a cut out point. And it, depending on where the suction pressure lands, it'll cut in and cut out accordingly. And then if both of these are, you'll set one slightly offset from the other. So this may be your first stage, this will be your second stage loading and unloading. And then you can feel there's a little Allen wrench on the side. And you can take a cap off and adjust an Allen screw, and that'll adjust the DP between cut in and cut out. Okay. Well, this is a whole class of its own. We've done this class before. We've done full teardowns on these before. We've got the stuff to do it. We can do that. So we could do a complete semi-hermetic teardown at some point if you want. 
Uh, anyway, this again, it, it goes right back to this is strictly controlling load. And then these the cycle control is have to keep up with it just time. All right. Does this make sense? Actually, I really want to take one apart, but yeah. I've had to explain to you how to I think it makes sense. So. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thermal air volume. We'll wrap this up here. This is literally just a damper on the fan. Yeah, you're con instead of slowing the, the fan down or speeding it up, the fan maintains a constant speed. And there is a damper with an actuator that has a reference signal or maybe a Floating point. I think the majority of them use a reference, right? So we have two types of actuators. We have a digital actuator, which uses an analog signal, zero to 10 volt or one to five or whatever, to control position at any given time. So it'll have 24 volts always fed to it. And then it will have a zero to 10 volt DC signal, right? If I'm on, if I'm correct, what was that? If I'm correct, are some of those dampers on the new ERVs? Uh, let me think. <clears throat> I haven't seen it on Daikin or LG. Maybe some of the Mitsubishi's, but most of those. They're not going to use a damper. They'll have variable speed fan. That's what I was thinking. The Mitsubishi may do as well. Got you. So, and, and where some of that might make sense is if they've got two fan motors and they want to run at a really low load, you know, they'll, they'll stop one or close it down. And then still run the other one and it won't be bypassing through the other fan. Maybe something like that. I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing there. I'm not an expert on Mitsubishi VRV. I'll put that disclaimer out there. So, yeah, ERVs are totally different. <laughs> anyway, uh, so like I said, fan remains constant, a floating point actuator. Back to my, my train of thought there, you'll have a clockwise, a common, and a counterclockwise, depending on what direction we want to turn for so many seconds. We want to go three seconds clockwise to open it. We'll send 24 volts to those two wires for three seconds, and we'll open it by 10%, and it'll sit there until we decide to give it a clockwise or counterclockwise signal again. Uh, that would be a floating point actuator. Uh, I don't remember which one train uses specifically. Uh, anyway, that's all it is. As head pressure decreases, uh, we close the, the vein or the dampers and reduce flow to build head pressure back up. Fan doesn't change. Now, something that I will point out that kind of all this floats off of is say you have two stages of, of we'll keep it simple. Say you have your your you have two fans running on uh, contactors, their constant volume, and you have one variable speed or variable volume fan. Either way, what'll happen is when that system first turns on, your variable uh, speed fan. Usually, I've seen carriers do something different. 
but usually the variable speed fan will be the first one to ramp. Once it reaches 100%, then the constant volume fans will kick in and they'll ramp up, or not ramp up, they'll come on. And your variable speed fan or your variable air volume one will ramp down until the head pressure builds back up, then it'll come back up. And it'll turn back off in a inverse cycle. So as the head pressure drops, we start to reduce fan speed. Once that reaches a minimum, then as we continue to drop in head pressure, it will cycle the these constant speed fans down. And uh, then as head pressure begins to build back up, we will ramp the variable speed fan back up or down accordingly. Until then, it's just a constant back and forth cycle. So that cycle works whether you've got two stages of, of constant volume fans, one stage, three stages, no matter how many fans you're cycling, that will be the process. Caveat there is some of the carrier RTUs, I've seen them cycle the constant speed fans first and then bring the variable speed fans on last. Why? I don't know. They're carrier. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not me. Really when he first starts that, I'm just saying it's like, why is this the order it's going in? Makes sense after you figure that out. You can think of it as a condenser fan and say that it can be a condenser of sin. And say, like, well, the variable speed fan being a maximum of sin, and you go down to 9, 8, 7, 6. So if you have the other ones turned on, and those are full, so those are 10 to themselves. That's kind of how that's how it's going, I guess. But like, if you're cutting down from 30, you're going to kind of you're going to fill those nines, you're going to go 29, so that very few people are going to go 29 as you get to 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a math person for that. That, 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 that would confuse everyone in the hell of me. I can't think of it like that. Uh, my brain doesn't work that way. I see why it makes sense for you. That's right up your alley. Not mine. Any final questions? Anybody online? Anything? This is head pressure control 101. The basics. <laughs> we got a little more advanced than actual good basis. Working I think we It's pretty rare for residential to have that cycle. I've seen the new inverter system on it come on. Anyway, we're good. We're going to call it. We're back up. I'm a good one. Sorry for the rescheduling stuff. Appreciate it, guys. I'm going to shut y'all down.